Welcome everybody to Congregation Lador of the Doors Parson to Parson program on Zoom with Rabbi Barry Silver and Minister Fritz Oftenkamp or Pastor. The most Reverend Fritz Oftenkamp. The most Reverend Fritz Oftenkamp. It is um, April 22, 20, uh, April 18th, 2022. Hi. And we wish you all well and take it away, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, Fritz, I don't know. I think you might be considered by some the least reverend. <laughs> <laughs> and I might be considered the least uh, traditional. So I think we're a good good pair here to uh, embark on Parson to Parson. And uh, it is a name that I derived from my dad. He had a radio program called Parson to Parson about uh, probably about 80 years ago, back in Stanford, Connecticut. So I uh, carry on his legacy by trying to bring ministers of different faiths together and uh, sharing different views. And uh, on this program, we uh, disagree agreeably, although Fritz and I usually are on the same side as most issues, but you never know. We might find one where we diverge, which is fine. Uh, but you, we're going to talk about current events and anything that anybody else wants to speak about. So, uh, Fritz, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, ask you uh, on the day after Easter, what's on your mind? I know you sent out a, a missive, an epistle to uh, your email list and you got some responses that were um, very positive and others that were not in agreement. And, uh, you know, you can comment on that or whatever else you'd like. So take it away. Um, yes, I, I do get some uh, people that have different opinions of what I'm trying to do. Um, the, the latest thing I can update you on is that I received a two-page letter from the president of my seminary. Two pages of many words but she still will not say what she believes happens to Christians and non-Christians at the point of death. There's something about our theology that maybe we're at the point in time where adults are finally beginning to recognize the horrendous theology we have about non-Christians. So I will be visiting her in person this summer, and I will see if in face-to-face -face if she will share with me what she personally believes. I find it so strange that religious people are fearful of sharing what they personally believe. It's very, very strange, but I think we are finally, well, I don't know. I'm always very hopeful. I hope hopefully that we're finally seeing the light, so to speak. Yeah, well, the, uh, the zeitgeist, as they say, has changed. The um, zeitgeist literally means the spirit of the times. It used to be perfectly acceptable to say that your religion was the valid one and the other ones are invalid. The word orthodox means true teaching and uh, Catholic means universal, implying that their faith is the only one that could possibly be true for everybody. And uh, these things were just said as a matter of course. So, well, naturally we believe that ours is the only game in town and anybody who doesn't believe like us is gonna be sent into some terrible place but today and our with our modern sensibilities it seems a little peculiar but just but like if you were to go ahead Fritz. why i don't know how hard you how hard you've tried but why can we not get christians to be a part of this and share their beliefs about these things if if if, 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 they, if they really believe this why are they unwilling to share or, or come on with you and with me and discuss uh, what their beliefs are well, you know what uh, Thomas Paine said? He said, it is error, not truth, that shrinks from inquiry. So people who are saying things that are not true or indefensible don't want to confront someone with a different point of view. That's why I'm saying in the old days, it was okay to say, we're going to heaven and you're not. But today with modern sensibility, it doesn't sound right. So they prefer just letting, leaving that unspoken or just saying it to their own crowd and not saying it out in polite society. I got a, an email from someone who was saying how horrible it is that there was some, I guess some comedian was mocking Jesus. 
And he was saying, this is horrible, it's blasphemous, it's offensive. And so I wrote him back saying, you sound a little like those uh, Muslims who were all bent out of shape because they were mocking Muhammad. I said, seems like you guys have a lot in common. I disagree with you. I think it's fine to mock Jesus, Muhammad. I make jokes about Moses. I think that a sense of humor is the first casualty of fanaticism. And I think it's perfectly okay. So let's, um, how about if we debate? You and I will debate. So uh, he says, well, I'm gonna have to pray on that a little bit. Let me get back to you. <laughs> so anyway, um, about a week later, he calls me back. He says, well, I, I prayed on it and um, I, I decided it's not really a good idea to do that. To so speak, I said, you convert Jews? What an opportunity. Yeah, so I said, I don't know who you're praying to. I said, but if you believe God wrote Christian scripture, he's commanding you to go out to the Jews and convert them. Here I am. I said, not only me, I'll broadcast it to my whole congregation, all the Jewish people I know. You can have at it, and you can you can try to convince all of us, uh, all all of those people who have gone astray, and uh, you can fulfill your biblical mandate. So he says, "Well, you know, um, I haven't really studied up on it that much." So I said, "What's the study? You got God on your side. You're in, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. You don't have to worry about that. All I all I have is information. You have the truth." <laughs> so uh, I remind people that Jesus said, if you if you're not gonna stand up for me, I'm gonna spew you out of my mouth. <laughs> so apparently he had this great opportunity and he uh, decided not to. So I said, all right, well, if you um I said, if you ever get the courage of your convictions, give me a call. Yeah. <laughs> and I've I'll be people, glad to chat. I've had people who've responded to some of my writings and I asked them, uh, can I share this? And they'll say, no, no, no. <laughs> they have no courage. How, do, how am I supposed to respect what they're saying if they're afraid to let me share it with my friends? Uh, <laughs> makes no sense. Yeah, and that's how you can tell they don't really believe what they're saying. Uh, but you're right. I, I've gone out of my way to try to get fundamentalist Christians to come on with me and chat, to go into their church, to have them come to my synagogue. But nothing doing. And the other ones who really, really run away from any type of discussion are the uh, the Orthodox, the Orthodox Jews. They they tend to want nothing to do with it. We have had some on um, with us temporarily. They're no longer with us, so to speak. They found other things to do. But even with them, I had to like handle it with kid gloves. But in general, the Orthodox want nothing to do with discussing things with non-Orthodox because their Orthodox means the true doctrine and uh, their patron saint uh, rabbi schneerson who they call the rebbe who they think is the messiah he told them don't go into reform synagogues because they uh, might contaminate you with their evil ways and you might start to think like them so they're they're told by their gurus not to mix it up with uh, non-orthodox so it's, it's a very very unhealthy thing I and then we see I'm criticized for putting Jesus down, which which I rarely do. In fact, I stand up for Jesus and say, he told us what the greatest teaching was. I, 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 I confirm that all the time. And this is what will unify Christianity with the world. If we will simply get in touch with what he said was the greatest teaching. That's true. I stand up um, for it. When it comes you know to what else is sad is that Republicans and Democrats, you know, I, I reached out to the Republicans, say, come on, let's let's chat they're not interested they don't they want to do it. we do have one uh, mike essen mike essen comes on and he has a program where he has both sides and he brings me on sometimes and uh and i give him full credit mike essen if you get a chance to listen to him he is somebody who's a rare individual who will bring republicans and democrats together and uh, he actually believe it or not gives the other side a fair hearing i've been on with him and contrary to many of the uh, pundits on one side or the other who shout you down and don't give you a chance, he, he gives me a full chance. He even lets me uh, sing some of my songs and uh, <laughs> we have a good time, but that's a rarity, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Fritz, so what do you think uh, we should be doing as far as getting the religions together? How should we, what do we need to do to make that happen? Well, <clears throat> everyone, tells me well you, you got to talk about the muslims you know they're the ones that are really bad and i said we need to look at our own house if we can get our house in order and and 
and, and be a, a, me a messenger of some kind that we can change our attitude. Maybe some other groups will kind of look at it and say, well, well, maybe we can do the same. I, like, by example, I would hope that we could break down these barriers and, and bring religions closer together. Well, you know, when they criticize Islam, wasn't there a rabbi a couple of thousand years ago who said, he whose Bible is without sin, let him cast the first stone? Absolutely, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I, and I remind people that, yes, yes I do criticize Christianity and I make, and, and I, I make critical comments, but I don't condemn anybody to hell. I make critical <laughs> comments, but I'm not condemning anyone to hell, but they don't seem to get it. Well, what I like is that I like the people that they go out pontificating about Christianity and telling everything about the religion and what God believes. They're speaking for God. And then, and then all of a sudden you say, well, what about Jewish people? What happens to them? And and then they they usually say, "Oh, I don't judge. I, I don't I don't make exactly. any judgment." Exactly. I said, well, well, "Wait a minute." <laughs> I said, "You're telling me that God wrote Christian scripture. You're telling me all about what God believes. You're saying all of his. You know his mind. All of a sudden, now when it comes to Jewish people, it's pretty clear in the Christian scripture what's going to happen. You know, it, all of a sudden now, oh, who am I to judge?" <laughs> Oh, exactly. Yes. They, they will not take responsibility for what we created. Well, the, well, the funny thing is, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they're judging. I, obviously, they don't judge. God does. But they, they, they pass it off and just say, well, who am I to judge? And of course, you're nobody to judge. But you believe that God is going to judge. That's what you preach every day. And all of a sudden now, it's like, oh, who am I? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's kind of like Rick, like, what? There's gambling going on in the casino? I never, I, I didn't know that. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's, a, it's really pretty funny. Are we, are, are we letting other people join us here? Yeah. I guess so. Let's bring other people in. Um, Harris, go ahead. Let's see, hear what you have to say. I don't know if you can see this. This is a book by uh, Sid Roth. Do you ever hear of him? No. He's on TV. He's an evangelicist or, you know, whatever you call him. Yeah. And he wrote this book about all these Jews that converted to become guys, Christians. Okay. So, and it's a very interesting story. These are all intelligent Jews and now they're Christians. So yeah. I thought it was very, and I don't know why you sent me this book, but. Uh, what's the title know. of the book, Harris? What's that? What's the title? Can you hold it up a little bit? They, they thought. They thought for themselves. They thought for themselves. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. a great title. Okay, well, um, if Sid Roth is listening, or if anybody knows this guy, tell him that he's invited anytime to come on here and convert all the heathen. We got some pretty intelligent people in our ranks, and he's welcome to debate with me, or to debate with Fritz, or to appear on Parson to Parson. We'll promote his book, and we'll see if um, he wants to help people think for themselves. And uh, he, he's welcome to join us. So okay. Sid Roth, has a, he has an open invitation to join. It sounds to me like he's got a Jewish name. So I wouldn't be surprised if he was born Jewish. No, he, was born, then... he was born into an Orthodox family. Well, there you go. And then he left the fold. Okay. I got name and I'm going to see if I can get it on Kindle. Okay. Maybe you can send him a personal invitation. <laughs> review. Yes. So how I'm did you sure... get the book, Harris? He mailed it to me. That's Do you weird. know him personally? No, never, no. But I see him on television all the time because I watch Christian television because quite a few Jews are on and uh, they have rabbis on that converted. They have uh, Jews for Jesus and whatever. You know, you can make a lot of money on TV. Absolutely, but you must have left your name or something with them right maybe you responded to something no, i never let my down but uh they found me so anyway uh <laughs> sid roth is very famous well i appreciate your sharing that with us because yeah we'd okay. love to have them on and uh and exchange views with him harris it's amazing what people can find out about you nothing is hidden anymore <laughs> yeah. well I went on a web and I put down how anti-Semitism started. Okay. And it started uh, in uh, Germany and uh, what's it, and uh, Luther, uh, what's his first name, Martin Luther? What was his first name? 
Yeah, Martin Luther. Yeah, that was his first. <laughs> that that was Hitler's hero. Yeah, he was the big. He 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 really made a he made anti-Semitism popular. I don't know what right. went on for him, but he really made it popular. Right. They they noted that in the beginning of the thing that, uh, you know. Yeah, Martin he was Luther. a big hero of Hitler. Hitler chose. Luther's birthday to launch Kristallnacht, which was the beginning and the end for the Jews. He thought that Martin Luther would definitely appreciate having the the Holocaust begin with his birthday. And he is a big fan of uh, Martin Luther. Well, actually, Martin Luther wrote a, I believe it was a book called The Jews and Their Lies. And in the book, he recommends what treatment should be meted out towards the Jews. And many of those suggestions were adopted in toto by Hitler, thinking that, well, if the founder of Lutherism and Protestantism, if he would approve of this, and I'm just following his ways, then certainly the Christians will go along with this, because I'm just doing what he suggested, and he was, uh, he was correct on that. And I think you, I might have mentioned before, the Catholic Church never excommunicated any Nazi, except for Goebbels because Goebbels married a Protestant. And that was the oh. only Nazi that the Catholic Church chose to really? excommunicate. Yeah, it's quite, a, it's quite extraordinary, the uh, support that they got. And the, um, the, the first government to recognize the authority of Hitler and his regime, the Nazi regime, was the Vatican. Vatican. And then once the Vatican accepted him, a whole bunch of other countries then came forward. And if they hadn't done that, you never knew what, uh, what might have happened in history. And the nations that were the most barbaric and anti-Semitic and collaborated with the Nazis were um, Catholic nations and nations dominated by the church, including, by the way, Ukraine, which was very much dominated by the Nazis. Russian Orthodox Church yeah. and enthusiastically participated in the uh, murders of Bobby R when there weren't enough Nazis to take yes. care of it. They, they recruited joined, local yeah. Ukrainians. Ukrainians joined the Nazis in the Second World War. Yeah, they were they were enthusiastic, but not just joined the Nazis, but they enthusiastically participated in murdering Jews in the Holocaust. Yeah. And uh, is, this where, they, is this where Putin gets this idea of cleansing the Nazis from Ukraine? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, yes, I think so. Well, well, what we don't realize is that there's a lot going on historically behind the scenes that we don't know about. Like in, I believe it was 969, this guy, Prince Vladimir, converted to Christianity. And he took the Greek Orthodox Church, converted to it, and then moved it up into his realm. And the first thing he did, he went into Kiev and he converted all the people there. And then he converted the Russians. It was all one at that time, Russia, Kiev was all one, do, one domain, and he converted them to Christianity, and they became one whole. And that's why Putin, looking back historically and with the support of the Russian Orthodox Church, is saying, hey, we're all one here. You know, we're, we're all one people, and these Ukrainians are artificially dividing up our people. And it is true also, I, I've read this, I haven't, haven't checked it out, but apparently Zelensky, what I read was, he made common cause with some former Nazis, neo-Nazis, ex-Nazis, in order to gain support to become the president. And uh, they, they also said that he wore, to get their support, an iron cross, which was like a Nazi insignia, in order to gain their support. That is something that I don't know if it's accurate, but I read it. And I do encourage people to do some background reading and check it out. Because if that's true, that this is very, very troubling, and we need to uh, well, when approach you're him a, with that. When you're such a minority, I can see why people sometimes will give in to the huge majority. And has it always been that way in uh, Ukraine? What's been yeah, well, the percentage in Ukraine? Well, it's always been that way politically that people form alliances with those that they think can help them gain power, even though they might be morally suspect. Unfortunately, this is what happens yeah. in politics to take power. I also read, I believe this is accurate, that Zelensky had Jewish parents, but he never ever mentions him being Jewish. And, and when he says that his family was wiped out, 
he never says it's because they were Jewish. He says because they were they were part of they were partisans or whatever. But he doesn't mention that. And his children apparently were baptized. And, oh uh, wow! And uh, baptized and raised Christian is what I read. Um, and again, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. It's interesting because if you read stuff from the right wing Jews, they really have it in for him. They don't really care for him at all. They think he's like a a traitor. Uh -huh. And if you read stuff from the liberal progressive Jews, they think he's a modern day hero and a saint. And uh, that's why I read stuff and watch stuff from both sides to try to get a true accurate picture because the stuff on the internet, I mean, people have access to grind and you have to say, okay, who's saying this? What's their political bent? Why are they saying it? And then I'm gonna find something from the other side to see if this is accurate, not many people do that, but it's important that we do if we're interested in finding out what's really going on. And then, then you have these right-wing Jews and, and right-wing other people who say, oh, the Ukrainians, they were horrible. They they collaborated with the Nazis. Why would we help them? And it's like, oh, wait a minute. That was like 85 years ago, <laughs> or about 80 years ago. Like anybody who's alive today didn't have anything to do with that. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, there's a tradition or a history of it, but that doesn't mean that these people today are, are implicated in it because they weren't even born then. But there's just not a lot of clear rational thinking going on these days. It's all very partisan. Anybody else want to jump in? Um, I want to say, Sarah? I want to ask one more question. Yeah. Yeah, Fritz, I don't believe that uh, Moses ever lived. Do you believe that Jesus lived? I, I don't know. I really okay. don't. I, and, and to me, it's almost irrelevant because I'm more interested and, and teachings as I pose as opposed to personalities. I think he was, if he did exist, he just like you and me, some guy trying to understand the world that he lived in. But, uh, but to me, it's not important whether these people actually lived. It's okay, it's, okay. It's what, it's what they said that I, I, I pick and choose with Jesus too. You know, I pick and choose with what he says, as with Moses. I I like to think of them as just like us. Well, let me ask you something, Fritz. If he did live, did he have blonde hair and blue eyes? I think so. I think so. <laughs> he was a good German. <laughs> this who, is, speaking no, of German, who, I'm not talking about Jesus. <laughs> well, he was of the Aryan race way back then. Uh, this is why it's important. You know, people at the Unitarian Church, they all assume I'm a member there. And I said, no, 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 I'm not a member here. I want to maintain my authenticity as a Lutheran because Lutherans of any group that should be able to recognize what has happened in Christianity with our history, we're the ones that should be stepping up there and saying, listen, this needs to change. Look at, look at us and what we did. We should be the first ones out there making this change. Yeah, most religions don't do that. Yeah, Martin Luther would definitely was Germanic, but Jesus definitely did not have blonde hair and blue eyes. If he did, if he did live, he, uh, <laughs> He would look probably kind of like a modern day Israeli or an Arab. Or like you, perhaps, perhaps like you, Barry. Yeah, maybe look like me, right? <laughs> skin, that doesn't get, get, skin that doesn't get skin cancer. Okay. <laughs> uh, Fritz and I had a conversation today because <laughs> he was telling me that uh, he used to hang out in the sun all the time and he's got um, skin cancer that they're peeling off of him. So, uh, yeah. I said, yeah, with your, with yours, he said, with my complexion, I have to be kind of careful. I said, yeah, I can go out in the sun. It doesn't, I know it doesn't affect fine. me so much. Fine. <laughs> well, I have one All more right. thing to say. I yeah, go ahead. The, I think the writers of the Bible were sensational. They can write all that great stuff back there, uh, whatever, 500 years ago or wherever they wrote it. I think it's incredible, the Bibles. Yeah, well, they certainly had a flair for the dramatic and, uh, Jewish scripture's got a lot of things that make any book a bestseller. It's got a lot of sex and violence and drama and, and people getting wiped out and stuff like that. So it's, it's naturally a bestseller. And uh, Christian scripture, it's a little more passive, but it, it does offer heaven and hell. And so people are interested in that. And Armageddon's a great book. If you read the, the book of Revelations, that's got a lot of... Uh, we love that book. Of, we love that book. <laughs> yeah, a lot of excitement. Yeah, I went into a church the other day, and they said, hey, um, you came a little late. We were just reading about Revelations. I said, oh, I'm kind of glad I missed that. I don't really feel like getting to the part where I'm getting sent down to hell. So he said, oh, we wouldn't send you to hell. No, no, no. Of course not. Absolutely not. <laughs>
But yeah, Revelation is a very exciting book. Um, anybody else want to share some thoughts with us? So do, <laughs> do you want to talk about the new uh, Supreme Court judge or um, more uh, about yeah. Ukraine and where you think that's going? And Yeah, good idea. Thanks for prompting us. Go ahead, Fritz. What do you think? <laughs> I love her. <laughs> I was just made to see her. It, it, it brought out a lot of ugly stuff in some people, but I love this lady. Yeah, there was a lot of um, a lot of negativity and ill will towards her. But, you know, I I mean, I, I'm glad that she's on the Supreme Court. I think she's really smart. I think she's yeah. got good qualifications. I agree. And uh, I think it's about time that we had an African-American woman on the Supreme Court. But I, I was less than thrilled with her responses to some of the questions. Like they would ask questions and she wouldn't answer them. Like, um, your, did your organization do this or were you sponsoring these books or something like that? There's a lot to remember, I don't know. You know, they're asking her about um, critical race theory. It's like, well, I don't know, I never heard of it or something. It's like, come on, you're running for the Supreme Court. You must have dealt with it. You must have some opinion on it, but she didn't say anything because she. I guess she's playing politics, doesn't want to get derailed. It's like, it's funny, like they ask these people who are running for president, oh, what do you think about abortion? Oh, gee, I know, I don't know. I never really thought about that before. <laughs> like, come on, everybody and their sister has an opinion on abortion, you never thought about it? And it's like, I'm thinking, you know, if you've never thought about abortion, you have no business running for president. Like, where have you been in a cave? You know, you're not talking about critical race theory. You're not thinking about Black Lives Matter. They asked her a bunch of questions and it's like, she kind of dodged them or, didn't really answer them. I realize how close this vote could be. Yeah. Yeah, I know. She was doing what I guess what she had to do. They can't be more honest. You are so right about that. It is a yeah. shame they cannot share what they how they feel. Yeah. Well, it's like we were talking about before, Fritz. You know, we asked somebody, what do you think? And they they don't want to tell you. You know, that's that's what the world's coming to. I, I want a candidate for Supreme Court who's gonna just say, This is what I think, you know, or Sometimes they, they can't say it because it's going to be a question that's going to come before them, but there's very little honesty. And then on MSNBC, they're just gushing with praise, like, oh, she's the greatest thing in the world. They would never mention, like, well, hey, you forgot to answer, like, four or five questions. And then you got Cory Booker, who's like, he was, like, so overflowing with enthusiasm. You look like my mother. You're, you're like my mother. And it's like, okay, well, maybe that's why these people voted against her, because she didn't look like their mother. <laughs> so what does that mean? That all the white people should vote for a white woman because they look like her, their mother and the black? I mean, it, it's one thing to say it's about time to put someone, a black woman on the Supreme Court. But there's another to just go overboard and say, like, this is the main reason why I want her on the court. It's it, it's too much identity politics. Not only do I don't do I think it, it's kind of offensive. I think it's definitely hurting the Democratic Party. I think the Democratic Party is turning off a lot of people with this identity politics. Like, if, if you're black, you can do no wrong, you know? Like, and if you're a white male, like, who needs you? It's, it's too much. It's like the pendulum with them is swinging too much the other way. And the, the prime example of that is Black Lives Matter, a, a group that's steeped in anti-Semitism, violence against police, has anti-Israel stuff in their charter. and um, they're just like the cat's meow and nobody can criticize them. I when I have in the past, I've, I've been uh, lambasted by diehard liberals. Like, how dare you say something bad about them? It's like, well, well can I just say what's true? They, they don't tell me I'm wrong. That's the funny thing. They don't say, no, you're wrong. They don't equate Israel with apartheid and with genocide. They don't do that. They don't tell me I'm wrong. It's like, well, why are you bringing that up? We don't want to hear it. It's silly. It's clear, especially with this recent shooting, it's clear that there's a problem with the police and the black community. It's clear. And it's also clear that to many police officers, too many, black lives don't mean much. But what's also clear is that Black Lives Matter is not the right organization to bring this movement forward and to lead the movement. They, they are not the right group and many many people in the black community want nothing to do with them because they recognize that but on um, in the white and like the liberal circles and msnbc they you, you can't say anything bad about these people at all mm -hmm. uh let's say what about um 
Fritz had something. Fritz had a comment before. Go ahead, Fritz. Share. Uh, at some point, we've got to move beyond this uh, identity stuff that goes on. Uh, maybe once we, once this lady's on the Supreme Court, maybe we could start getting back to just getting someone that's good, period, <laughs> whether black or white. But for some reason, we're still stuck in this trying to uh, equalize things. And we feel like we've got to identify with a certain group in order to make that happen. But we've got to get beyond that somehow. Agreed. And the other thing that's horrible is the uh, politicization of the Supreme Court. Like, Oh. All the Republicans are just voting against people before they even know who it is. Uh, right. And then even exactly. if you, you, be, before they even pick someone, we're not going to bring it to the yeah. floor. I mean, the politicization of the Supreme Court is just, it's debauching the legal system. This is the highest court in the land. And it's like the most politicized and corrupt. It's like, it's ridiculous. And, and the uh, proceedings where they choose people, like I mean, I, the Kavanaugh looked like he was just, a bald-faced liar. And uh, I don't think he has any business on the Supreme Court. And then you got this other guy, Thomas, whose wife is running around shilling for the uh, insurrectionists and doing all these crazy things. <laughs> and he's and he's there voting that Trump shouldn't have to produce records that would shed light on this because his wife is implicated. I mean, how clear-cut a, a conflict do you have to be before the guy just says, hey, this isn't right? I mean, they're, they're the court of last resort, so they pretty much do what they want. But somebody should have blasted him by now and said, you have no business voting on this. You have no business sitting on the Supreme Court. Like, if you don't have the discretion and the judgment to know that what you're doing is wrong, how could you possibly rule on anything? <laughs> Your whole system of what's right and wrong is severely compromised. The guy has no business being on the court. Uh, going back to Ukraine, Barry, can you think of any similarities between our civil war and what's going on between Russia and Ukraine? No, I don't. Relatives, anything? No. That, uh... I, don't, I don't see any similarities because Ukraine is an outside power. I understand what you're saying, like the Russian Ukrainian people seem to be kind of like homogenous for a while, but you got, you really what you have is you have a madman, a, a, a brutal, vicious dictator who just wants power for himself, who murders his enemies. And, and I think it's the antithesis really of, of, of the civil war. And it's, it's interesting also, you know, the, the civil war with Robert E. We saw the other one as. What's that? We each saw the other side as out of touch with what, with what, with reality. Well, that's true. I mean, I mean, the two sides are, are, strongly at odds with each other and fighting uh, with a completely different, they have a different, completely different mindset. That's true. That's true of most most wars where they and vilify country, the other. Once our country observed that, we realized that we can't settle differences between the states with a war. Do you think that could ever happen with Russia and Ukraine? That, that we've, we've seen here that this method of solving, because it may go on for, for a long time, that this method of solving problems is not going to work, and we got to find some other way of these two countries uh, getting along. Well, you know, it's interesting, for instance, that it actually did work to it in, in a way. I mean, it was settled on the battlefield. The, the, the North didn't prove that they were right or that they had the better argument by the Civil War. The Civil War only proved that they were more powerful and they succeeded. Now, we also believe, most of us, that they were also right. But that had nothing to do with why they won. They won because of superior military force. But here's what's very interesting, is that when the war was over, there was a, the, the actual terms of surrender were written up by a Native American, a guy named Eli Parker, who um, worked for uh, Grant, for General Grant. He actually wrote it up and he appeared at the uh, signing in Appomattox. And, uh, and Robert E. Lee, noticed him because he was like the only one with dark skin. He was a, a Native American. He was like, a, um, I think he had a American mother, a Native American father, something like that. And he said to the guy, he says, hey, at least we have a real American here. And according to legend, Eli Parker said, we're all Americans. And then what happened was uh, Robert E. Lee asked Grant, he said, look, I'm willing to surrender, but I want to be able to surrender with dignity. I want my people, all, all, I want all the people that fought to be able to take their a mule 
home with them and to be able to have enough to be able to uh, start, you know, do a, have a job or to um, plant their crops or something like that. And I don't want them humiliated. And Grant said, absolutely. He, he agreed to all of it without even asking Lincoln, because Lincoln told him, I want to reconcile and I don't want to have a situation where we're fighting. Now, some of Lee's general or some of his officers said, no, 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 don't surrender at all. We'll, we'll just disband and we'll have a guerrilla war in the South and they'll never take it over. And Robert E. Lee said, no, I don't want continued fighting. Maybe we would win, but you'd tear the country apart. I don't want that. I want reconciliation. And he and Grant shook hands and they reconciled for the sake of the country. So Lee had, a, I mean, he's fighting for a bad cause, but he had a certain amount of moral integrity and responsibility to him. Putin doesn't have anything like that. Putin would take down the whole world if he had to. He would, yeah, he would launch this, a nuclear weapon. Compare this with World War II. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, the other thing is that if some people are comparing the Russian attack against Ukraine with the Holocaust, and that I think is a very unfortunate comparison to make. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we can look at something and say, this is horrific, this is terrible, this is unacceptable, this should be stopped, and this is morally outrageous. We can do all of that without saying it's like the Holocaust, because it's not like the Holocaust. And, and the, the, the people of Ukraine are being helped by the very people who conspired with the Nazis, Poland and Hungary and these other countries. These, these countries are coming forward and helping and taking in refugees. And like the whole world is united behind the people of Ukraine. The Holocaust was night and day different. There, the world turned a blind eye, or many people collaborated. And uh, Hitler wasn't trying to change the Jewish people's ideology. He wasn't trying to get them to think like we're all one people. He was just out to murder them and annihilate them. So the, the comparison really doesn't, it, it doesn't accurately portray what was going on in the Holocaust. It was pretty... It's pretty grisly. It was different. But that doesn't mean that, oh, well, it's not the Holocaust. I guess we don't have to worry about it. It's like, <laughs> I, I believe on Ukraine that this is ghastly, grisly, gruesome, grotesque, gratuitous violence, and that the world community should stand up and do a lot more, more than just watch. And I think that it's morally repugnant that anyone would buy one dime's worth of oil from Putin. There should be a 100% absolute boycott of every product, especially coming out of Europe. And we should do what we did during World War II, when we rationed gas, rationed oil, rationed rubber, rationed food, and sent stuff over to people in need. We should, instead of saying, oh, well, we're dependent on Russian oil, we should say, let's all make sacrifices like the greatest generation. Let's ration our use of oil and gas and fossil fuels and find some other source and sacrifice and get by with less, but we're not buying another drop of oil from Russia. That's what I think the world should do. And it's outrageous morally that we're not doing that. The more life pleasures we have, the more difficult it is for us to give up and sacrifice like they did in World War II. I wonder, that's interesting what you just said about how many of us would be willing to do that. We've been so comforted with uh, wonderful things that for us to uh, do something like that, uh, I don't, I, I'd be curious as to what, how that would work. Well, here's the other thing, Fritz. Like, has our president ever suggested that we do that? Has no. Biden ever said, hey, guys, no, let's make it. sacrifices? No, not at all. He would you know what? <laughs> He's not. That's not. Could you imagine Roosevelt saying, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. Just keep Keep living a life of luxury. You know, just use, use, use. Don't worry about it. We don't have to make sacrifices. We'll let them in Europe deal with all that. If we can... Remember, we've got a bunch of people in this country who uh, uh, don't necessarily support Ukraine. They talk yeah. about the ugly stuff that's going on in their government and just, just a way of somehow escaping, avoiding any responsibility for what's going on. Well, we also have a bunch of people who vilify Biden and anything he does. You, you can't speak the truth and just say normal things without somebody coming after you. Like if he said, hey guys, we have to sacrifice, they'd be attacking him. Look at this guy. 
He's making us go without oil, without gas. He's telling us to sacrifice. He's hurting the American people. He's destroying our economy. Like whatever he says, they're going to make him look like a buffoon. But I think he should exercise real leadership and tell the American people, let's sacrifice and let's boycott and isolate Russia and ask Europe to do that. That's what leaders do. But there's a dearth of real leadership in the world today, except for the bad guys. The bad guys, they have their strong men. And the good guys, we have our weak men. Um, anybody else want to share some thoughts with us about these things? Go ahead, Harris. Well, when I play tennis and I miss the shot, I would always say Jesus Christ. And then I, most of the tennis guys have dropped out. And when I'm in a tennis center, I see a guy with Villanova University, which is a Catholic university. And I said, are you still Catholic? And he started laughing. So what's going on today is everybody is dropping out of religion today. And uh, in a hundred years, what's going to happen? Uh, maybe we'll have 20% in religion or what? Everybody's dropping out. Yeah, you know, um, one of the biggest categories of Jews today is spiritual, but not religious. You ask right. young people, um, are you Jewish? Well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. It's like, they don't want to be associated with religion. Right. Like, what, they, what has happened? What, what's they, going on? Or, or they'll say, gastro, I'm a gastro. Gastronomic Jewish. Jew, right. Gastronomic Jew, food? not a religious Jew. I'm gastronomic. Well, I, I, eat asked, my, I mean my matzo ball soup and chopped liver. <laughs> right. <laughs> they asked Mark Cuban if he was Jewish. And he says, I'm not a practicing Jew. Right. And that's so like a that, badge of honor. It, right. It, so, and especially the Catholics are dropping out, you know, and everybody's dropping out. Well, it's well, a, let me just offer a, a thought on that. It's like, it's a badge of honor to say I'm not religious because to most people, religious means you're doing crazy things, irrational things, meaningless, trivial right. rituals that don't mean right. anything. And right. you're, and you're paying lip service to a, a a personal God out there that most people think is fiction and you don't believe in real stuff like science. So the problem is that a lot of people equate religion with the orthodox far right end of it because they think they're the most religious. And so that's what people mean by I'm not religious. Like someone's like you get people say I'm not religious, I'm reformed. It's like, huh? It's like, <laughs> I thought that was religious. But to them, the more right wing you are. And so a lot of people don't want to be associated with them. And that, that's why it's so critically important that we offer an alternative and we offer it loud and clear and say, hey guys, you know what? Let me tell you what religious means. Religious means you care about the planet. Religious means you're trying to bring people together. Religious means that you value and respect life. Religious means that you cherish every day. That's what we need to send as a message. That's what religious means because most people don't think of in terms of, oh, he's religious. Like a lot of people say, I'm not religious. And I ask them some questions and I say, no, actually you're very religious. You're just not traditional, but you're religious. So that's why what we do at Lador Vador is to offer people a different understanding of what it means to be religious, which comes from the same word as root as ligament, meaning to join together. It means people joining together to make this world a better place and to recognize our kinship. And organizations can do powerful things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you say, well, I'm just doing my own thing. Like, don't you care about making the world a better place? Yeah, I do that on my own. It's like, yeah, yeah. How, how's that working for you? You know, like one person on their own. How, is, how does that work? You know why a laser is so powerful? It takes all the photons and it channels them all in the same direction. And when they're all moving in the same direction, they could send a beam right up to the moon or they could cure cancer. But when they're all diverse and diffuse, then they're not quite as powerful And anymore. fighting so, each other. Yeah, they're fighting each other, right? So we need to join together. It's like a Seder I did, somebody said, um, oh, you didn't do all the traditions, what's the matter? I wasn't a real Seder. And it's like, well, you know, we have like 350 people here. So they all have different ways of doing things. Well, you didn't do it the right way. You didn't do it with all the traditions. They said, do you know what the word Seder means? You know, they're, they're from Israel, you know what Seder means? I said. Yeah, it means order. So I said, well, you got to have a certain order. I said, yeah. I said, do you know what evolution means? Do you know what rational thinking means? It means you adapt and you change. And then I said, do you know what sinat chinam means? Sinat chinam means gratuitous hatred. It means just hatred for the sake of hating. 
And according to the rabbis of old, the reason why the Jews were destroyed, by, the temple was destroyed by the Romans and the Jews were defeated, it's said by the rabbis of old, that was due to sinat chinam, that the, the Jewish people were fighting with each other so much that they couldn't devote themselves to a higher cause. And, and this is literally true. It's, a, it's a, a sad aspect of history that when the Romans were gathering outside the walls of Jerusalem and they were gathering their forces and getting ready to invade and knock down the walls and attack Jerusalem, while that was happening, within the walls of Jerusalem, the Jews were fighting and in some cases killing each other. So that by the time the Romans got there, it was easy pickings. Imagine, imagine just how insane that is, how, how crazy that is. I wonder if that will ever happen to Ukraine, where the people start turning on each other because of things going so poorly, or will they be able to maintain this solidarity that they presently see? Uh, I, I think that they're on the right path. I, I think they're going to maintain solidarity because they're doing well. That solidarity is working. They're beating Russia. I think they're going to stay united. It's also true that in the uh, in America, the Native Americans, when the uh, you know the the West and the, and the white people were just decimating them, they also were fighting each other and making alliances, some with the whites and some against them, and fighting each other. That if they could see history and they could see the big picture and they could see what was going to happen to them, that their whole culture would be erased. You know, they would have a different perspective. Well, we need to take a broader view and look at the big picture and see where we're going as a species. Um, anybody else want to share some thoughts? We covered Ukraine, Putin. Yeah, go ahead, Sharon. So this Friday is Earth Day and um, wanted to know what we're doing to help the planet. <laughs> as a Celebrate group. Celebrate the birthday of the Earth. <laughs> Yes, well, of course, at Lador Bador, we'll be tying in protection of the planet with our Jewish Shabbat celebration. So we'll, we'll still be talking about that and urging people to get involved and, and take action. This protecting the planet is, in my opinion, the number one religious yeah, issue of our absolutely time. Absolutely the number one, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we'll be doing. If you want to hear that message, join us. Um, we got a lot of, a lot of good things going on at Lador Vador. If you know of any people who want to debate with us, conservative Christians, Orthodox Jews, Republicans, tell them they're welcome to join us and we'll give them a fair hearing. Um, we're also going to have our really cool and fun celebration of life for my mom on May 1 at 10 o'clock. And uh, everybody's welcome to join us. It's going to be a Beth Israel at Anjag and Woolbright. But if you can't get out there, no worries. We're going to have it out by Zoom. So you'll be able to join in by Zoom. And we got some really good ent entertainment, some inspiring words. And uh, everybody's welcome to try to carry on her legacy. I'll just share with you that uh, my mom often said, if you ask, like, hey, how you doing? She go, terrific, but I'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and that's the approach that we're going to use like how how was your mom's life her life was terrific but she can make the world better if we can adopt her attitude and try to continue that in in us we can help carry on her legacy and make the world better by uh, learning from her ways so uh, you're all welcome to join with us and I think we'll close it out unless anybody has anything else to say. Go ahead, Harris. You want to sing a song or something? No, I want everybody to uh, go on the web and hit Sid Roth and see what comes up. I will. All right. I also want you to hit Rabbi Schneider. He has a thing, uh, the Jewish Jesus, that he spends hours on 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 Christian television. So these two Jews are have a lot to do. Rabbi Schneider and Sid Roth. Got it. So look them up on uh, the web and you it'll blow your mind how much you're going to read about them. Harris, thank you so much. And we'll try to get both of them. Maybe one or both will join with us in discussion. But thank you so much. That sounds like very, very interesting reading. Yeah. And we will definitely do that. Thank you. Okay. And thank everybody. I thank everybody for joining with us. Uh, Pastor Fritz Oppenkamp, I thank you also. And if you regain access to your ukulele room, 
then maybe next time you can uh, play a little song for us and we'll entertain us. But thank you for entertaining us with your uh, wit and your wisdom. It's always a pleasure being with you on Parson to Parson. Thank you, Sharon, for making all of this possible and for your beautiful Passover background. And thank you everybody for joining with us and uh, watching Parson to Parson. Shalom. <laughs> Good night.